Hi, I'm Dr. Ruchika Goyal, and this is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Hi, everybody. This is Joe Chaffin. Welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. This is episode 092. Thank you so much for your patience. It's been a while since I've put out a new episode, but I'm very much looking forward to having more frequent episodes coming out in the coming months. Today, I have a really great interview for you that I did a number of months ago with my friend, Dr. Ruchika Goyle, where she and I are discussing platelet use in ITP and TTP and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. But before we get to that, you should be aware that this particular episode is not a continuing education episode. You can find those episodes where you can get free continuing education hours at bbguy.org slash podcast. They are cleverly labeled with the letters CE. You can also find those episodes at wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news, as well as, of course, any podcast podcast outlet such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, etc. The CE episodes are courtesy of transfusionnews.com and Transfusion News is brought to you by BioRed who has no editorial input into this podcast. So, okay, I really, really like today's interview, and it's not just because Ruchika Goyle is so brilliant and fun to talk to. The decision on whether to transfuse platelets when you're not sure the platelets are actually going to help or that they might even hurt is really one that blood bankers struggle with a lot. And Honestly, those who are ordering transfusions should be struggling with it too. Ruchika is going to discuss two papers that she and her colleagues published regarding platelet use in ITP or immune thrombocytopenic purpura, as well as the possible dangers of platelets in TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, as well as HIT, as I mentioned before, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. I think you're going to find a lot of information here that, and in fact, some of it that you may not have known before. I'm excited for you to hear it. Let me tell you a little bit about Ruchika. She has been a guest on this podcast before. Dr. Ruchika Goyle is an assistant professor of internal medicine and pediatrics in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Simmons Cancer Institute at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. She's also an adjunct assistant professor of pathology in the Division of Transfusion Medicine at Johns Hopkins. In addition, because that's not enough, she serves as the medical director of Impact Life, which is the blood center formerly known as the Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center. Ruchika is not only a transfusion medicine physician, she is also a practicing hematologist oncologist, and she's actively engaged in a lot of different research, especially focusing on big data applications in transfusion medicine, as well as in pediatric and neonatal transfusion medicine. She's the current chair of the pediatric subgroup of the ISBT, the International Society of Blood Transfusion, and she also participates in the AABB Standards Committee. Dr. Goyle has numerous accolades and awards. There's just too many to mention. You can, you can look at them at the show page on this episode at bbguy.org slash 092. She also has over 70 peer-reviewed publications to her name, and she's been invited to lecture nationally and internationally on numerous topics. I'm very, very excited for you to hear Ruchika's thoughts, and I'm ready to go. If you are, let's roll. Here's my interview with Ruchika Goyle that I'm calling When Platelet Transfusion Might Not Be Wise. Hi, Ruchika. Welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Hi, Joe. It's an honor to be here. Well, the honor is mine. I have been really looking forward to getting a chance to talk to you today about transfusion in some varying forms of thrombocytopenia. I think we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about transfusion in ITP, because that's something that you've published on, as well as some of the other forms of thrombocytopenia that we'll get into. But let's talk a little bit about ITP first. And I think it's really important for people to make sure that they understand the background and make sure that they just understand the basics. So if we can, can we just start with the name? I mean, I'm old enough that I've been around to hear the name of ITP standing for, it feels like about a million different things, but what technically is the most appropriate name for the entity that we abbreviate as ITP nowadays? I think, Joe, you're spot on with starting with actually the nomenclature. So it is a disease that has kind of gone a lot of change 
its name itself being defined. So ITP traditionally used to be called as immune thrombocytopenic purpura or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. And there's been a lot of discussion and debate about the name. And currently, it has been renamed to simply being called as immune thrombocytopenia. And the term purpura has actually been dropped because it's a bleeding symptom, but it's not present in all of the cases. So it's not like a defining feature. And so it's basically the international working group on ITP has renamed it simply as immune thrombocytopenia, although the word ITP still sticks around. I gotcha. I know that does confuse people because people try to remember what that P stands for. Ah, oh, what is it? Purpura? I guess. So I, I think that's important that we get that cleared up right away. But I think more importantly is for people to understand a little bit about the disease. And we're going to get into the specific details about the, the pathophysiology of, of ITP in, in just a second. But again, big picture, Ruchika, is ITP common? Does this happen often? So it is an autoimmune disorder and it is actually a relatively common cause of thrombocytopenia in both adults as well as children. And we say the estimated prevalence is somewhere from, you know, two to 10 cases per 100,000. And the incidence is about the same range, one to two cases per 100,000 patient years. It is more common in children, especially so the less than five-year-old age group. Mm -hmm. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the incidence of the and prevalence of in the adults actually is greatest in the elderly population. We do see some form of female preponderance as with other autoimmune disorders. So as the nomenclature has been revised, also the classification of ITP has recently been revised. And now newly diagnosed or acute ITP is ITP within the first three months. And three to 12 months we call as persistent ITP. And after 12 months, it's called as chronic ITP. So the presentation is variable with children most commonly having acute ITP, a single episode preceded by a viral infection, and then it typically resolves without needing a lot of intervention. In contrast, it's in the adult population and more so in the elderly that we see the chronic uh, manifestation of ITP, and it's persistent and keeps recurring. So there is quite a difference in the, as far as the definition goes, the manifestation clinically is very different. So we have this relatively common form of thrombocytopenia. Let's talk a little bit about why it happens and what the deal is behind it. What's the pathophysiology? What do we know about why this occurs? You mentioned it's autoimmune. Do we have more details than that? Yeah, certainly. So there are a range of pathophysiologic mechanisms which have been proposed, but the most common is that there are nonspecific antiplatelet antibodies. And what happens is that these are more recognizing the glycoproteins on the platelet surface, especially the GP1B9 and the GP2B3A glycoproteins. So the antibodies um, tend to coat the platelets, and these antibody-coated platelets are cleared from the circulation by the phagocytes sites in the reticular endothelial system, so primarily the spleen. And so what we are seeing truly is a shortened platelet survival as the primary pathophysiology of ITP. However, it's important to note that you know, while this is proposed as a primary mechanism, ITP antibodies, you know, the platelet-specific antibodies are not always detected in ITP patients. So other mechanisms have been proposed, for example, dysregulated T-cell function. So the T-regulatory cells function may be decreased. And some other mechanisms like antigen mimicry, for example, if we have it in context of other diseases like hepatitis C, they may be mimicking an antigen. But predominantly, it's the anti-platelet coding antibodies, which are the main mechanisms. You mentioned something there when you were talking about hepatitis C, and I know that there's been abundant discussion in the literature about primary versus secondary forms of ITP. And I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because that's not the the point of our, our time together today. But can you talk just very briefly about primary versus secondary ITP? So primary ITP or idiopathic ITP, as it used to be called previously, is basically when It's a diagnosis of exclusion when no underlying cause has been identified. It is seen more commonly, as I said, in the pediatric population. In contrast, secondary ITP can have a range of underlying disorders. For example, lymphoproliferative disorders, SLE, antiphospholipid syndrome, infections like hepatitis C, HIV, and some also immune deficiency syndromes like common variable immunodeficiency. In the routine setting, the commonest ones that we tend to see are hepatitis C, HIV, and the lymphoproliferative disorders. 
there's a whole lot more that we could go to there, but this is not meant to be an in-depth discussion of the pathophysiology of, of ITP. But I do think it's important for those of us in transfusion medicine world to understand a little bit of the background that those like you who cross both the clinical world and the transfusion medicine world deal with. So let's talk a little bit about when you see in your practice, for example, when you see a patient that you suspect has ITP, what are the steps that you take to establish the diagnosis? So like I said, Joe, it is a diagnosis of exclusion, and that's important to remember primarily, especially so for primary ITP. So we may have a clinical history like a preceding viral infection, especially so in the case of children and, you know, the youngest children present with it. For ITP specifically, as far as the diagnostic criteria goes, the cutoff is platelets less than 100K. But it's important to remember that they can present with a range of platelet counts and sometimes very low counts in like single digits or teens. And we first and foremost rule out, is there any other secondary cause responsible for the thrombocytopenia? For example, is there any new medications the patient is on? Typically in primary ITP, you will find a history of preceding viral infection. Or if it's secondary ITP, we start going down through our list of the other mechanisms I pointed out, like infections or lymphoproliferative diseases. We have to rule out obvious causes, you know, like chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, if it's a transplant patient, post-transplant thrombocytopenia. So all of those mechanisms once ruled out, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. It does not require a bone marrow testing for its diagnosis. And importantly, it does not require diagnosing antiplatelet antibodies for its diagnosis. Mm. It is essentially a clinical diagnosis. That's huge. I well remember days when I would look at bone marrows to evaluate a patient with ITP. And I have had many discussions with people about antiplatelet antibody testing not being, necess or being necessary in the past. So that's really interesting to know that neither of those is required necessarily to make the diagnosis. With that being said, uh, Ruchika, let, let's talk a little bit about what we're here to discuss today, which is how do you treat ITP? Let's just talk through, again, just as an overview, what are the various treatment options that a clinician might have? What are the tools in your arsenal when you're considering how to treat someone with ITP? We have primarily guidelines from American Society of Hematology, as well as there is an international working group dedicated to ITP um, treatment modalities. And we've actually had guidelines that came up very recently. So this is a good time to discuss. ASH, which is the American Society of Hematology, released guidelines in 2019. And same year, the International Working Group released its ITP treatment guidelines. And we classify them as primary treatment, which is a first line treatment typically is using steroids with or without combination with IVIG. And that happens to be the first line suggested treatment for most cases, whether it's primary or are you thinking secondary ITP in children or as well as adults. Mm -hmm. Once we have in most of the cases in children, especially with just a single treatment, the disease actually doesn't come back. And it's only in less than 20% of cases that a recurrent disease or what we would call as chronic disease comes up. In contrast, in adults, up to 70 to 80% of the cases can take a chronic form. So you will see the disease would come back either as you go in remission and the disease comes back, or there is some chronic low-level thrombocytopenia with or without bleeding symptoms that we have to deal with. So the second line treatment options, we have mostly immunomodulator therapy, which includes rituxan. We also actually could have thrombopoietin receptor agonists. So these are drugs that directly are working on the thrombopoietin receptor, the c receptor, to increase the platelet production at the marrow level. And then we have a novel treatment that got FDA approved in 2018 called as Tavalis or Fostimatinib, um, which is an oral sick inhibitor. And it's trying to target the pathophysiology of platelet destruction and trying to decrease the actual destruction process. So the tools in our armamentarium range from immunosuppressive therapy like rituxan, which is basically, you know, this anti-CD20 agent, which will work with suppressing the lymphocytes from producing the antibodies against the platelets, to working on the thrombopoietin receptor, you know, to try to produce more platelets, or the other end to try to decrease the platelet de destruction using a sick inhibitor like Tavalis, as I mentioned. If none of these therapies work, we have surgical interventions like splenectomy, 
which depending on the clinician preference, some people use that like a second line therapy as well. And then further, it comes down to third or fourth line therapy where we could have um, a range of immunosuppressions, for example, Vinca alkaloids, Dapsone, the list is like very extensive. But at that point, you're really talking about refractory disease. One thing that I just want to clear up a little bit, because we in blood bank world hear about this, and that's um, an intravenous form of RH immune globulin of anti-D in some patients with ITP. Is that still something that's considered? How commonly is that used nowadays? Yeah, I actually should have mentioned that, Joe. You're spot on. So anti-D therapy, intravenous form, is definitely still one of the frontline therapies recommended as a treatment option for ITP. It has to be used in patients who are RH positive for effectivity, right? Importantly, FDA issued a black box warning um, a few years ago about the possibility of hemolytic anemia or hemolysis, a major episode after anti-D administration. So the use of anti-D has decreased in the past decade or so. It definitely remains a treatment option, but we always monitor significant drop in hemoglobin after anti-D administration. In pediatric use, it is decreasing because we have just, you know, the range of options in our armamentarium are really increasing. So if there is something which has a potential for a significant side effect, it is something that's less preferred. Makes sense. Okay. Well, just again, before we before we move on to talk about specifically platelets, and I promise everybody I'm coming to that using platelets, from your perspective, again, with your, with your clinician's hat on for just a moment, you talked about using glucocorticoids, IVIG, et cetera. In, in the population of patients that you see with ITP, do those generally work? And if so, how quickly do they work? So Joe, they're Glucocorticoids and IVIG are definitely the most effective therapy, and they also are typically the quickest to take effect. Usually, we can start seeing an increase in platelet counts within two to three days, although the complete response may require one to two weeks, but they are still amongst the fastest responses that we see. As early as one day, we can start seeing a response. More typically, within two to three days after administration, platelet counts start rising. Okay, Ratika, so if those first line things don't work, what are your thoughts on the second line things like the thrombopotent receptor agonists? How long did those take to work and how effective are they? So most of the data, Joe, about the thrombopoietin receptor agonists and have evolved in the past couple of decades. They are highly effective medications, both l and Romiplastim. Those are the two top two thrombopoietin receptor agonist therapies that are used, and they in patients, they use a second line therapy. So like after steroids or IVIG are not effective typically, and they would have an effectiveness with showing median increase in platelet counts above 50,000 within two to three weeks of administration. Likewise, for the oral sick inhibitor, Tabalese, which I mentioned, that also shows effectiveness within two weeks of administration. So the point which I do want to highlight, which is important that you bring about, is that some of these medications, because they're trying to target the basic pathophysiology of an autoimmune disease, they may be effective, but they can take time. Their platelet counts will rise. The rise can be sustained, and it can actually in long term be effective in preventing bleeding, which is our primary goal of therapy, right? But they may take time anywhere from three to seven days or even longer. We are here to talk about using platelets in these situations, Rachika, because you've done a lot of work on this and you've published on this and and everyone that I want to make sure that you're aware that you can go to the show page for this episode and find a bunch of links to articles that Rachika and her colleagues have published on the use of platelets in some of these disorders that we're talking about today. So let's talk about platelet transfusions and ITP. You, you didn't mention platelet transfusions in any of your discussion previously about things that we would do for ITP. So let's let's talk about it. Do platelet transfusions even work in ITP? Is there a role for them? So I think, Joe, with your question about the timing for the effectiveness of the other um, therapeutic options, it's a perfect segue to bring in uh, a potentially very important role for role of platelet transfusions in ITP. So as we discussed that the primary pathophysiological mechanism is destruction of the antibody-coated platelets, 
So theoretically, the transfused platelets also tend to get coated with these antibodies which are targeting primarily the glycoproteins. So just as the native platelets are susceptible, the transfused platelets are also susceptible by the phagocytic action of the reticular endothelial system cells or the macrophages. However, what that can lead to is a shortened survival and a rapid clearance of the transfused platelets as well. Irrespective of this, there is a role, potentially important role, for emergency treatments of ITP. If a patient has severe thrombocytopenia and life-threatening bleeding, the treatment options that I mentioned previously can work, but they will take time. And that brings in the role that if there is an emergency bleeding, uh, which can be life-threatening, then there's a role for platelet transfusions at that time. I would like to preface it by saying that Majority of the bleeding in ITP is actually non-serious. And however, you know, it presents mostly with mucocutaneous bleeding, epistaxis, um, nosebleeds, purpura, as we said, but rare bleeding, for example, internal bleeding, including GI hemorrhage, genitourinary hemorrhage, and very critically, intracranial hemorrhage can happen as well. And what the epidemiological numbers tell us is that the intracranial hemorrhage, which is the most serious and the most concerning, can happen in 0.5 to 1.5% of the ITP cases. Okay. It can happen you know, in children as well as in elderly, more tendency to happen in the elderly. So if there is major life-threatening bleeding, we have to bring in an emergency therapy, which will be platelet transfusions. So what I'm hearing is that things that you would consider minor bleeding, such as nosebleeds, because I've, I've had this phone call, Richika, as I'm sure you have in probably in both your roles as a, as a hematologist, as well as, as, as a transfusion medicine expert, I've had the phone call that this patient has ITP and they have epistaxis. So I've got to start transfusing. What you're, what you're saying is that, that at least according to current evidence and current guidelines, that something like that would not be considered an urgent enough bleed that it would necessarily warrant a platelet transfusion. Is that accurate or am I overstating it? So, Joe, you're you're right with stating that typically an epistaxis would not be a major bleeding. Mm -hmm. However, this is something that is at the time left to the clinical judgment of the treating physician. An epistaxis can evolve into a major bleeding. So what's truly recommended is that follow a standardized bleeding assessment tool. For example, there's WHO grading criteria for severity of bleeding. So follow one of the bleeding assessment tools and Something which may be not at a very critical site, like intracranial hemorrhage, mm -hmm. could also evolve into a major bleeding if there is, you know, significant drop in hemoglobin. If it is something that's significant enough to be requiring blood transfusions, and otherwise not so harmless bleed can evolve into a critical bleed for the given patient. And the risk for actually fatal bleeding, but particularly, it's greatest in the elderly patients and with severe thrombocytopenia. Another thing I want to highlight here is that I do say severe thrombocytopenia. However, there's actually no specific platelet count or a number in ITP which is considered to be safe. As an example, in pediatric population, we actually ordinarily deal with extremely low platelet counts like in single digits and where the patient may be completely stable. Or in other case, we may have patients who have higher counts, like even above 30,000, and may experience a life-threatening bleed. So the bleeding phenotype can be very patient-specific. So there has a, there's a very important role for individualized therapy for taking into account what is actually happening at the patient level mm -hmm. in your decision-making for the treatment. That is so huge. And and I, I want to make sure that we don't leave that point, Rachika, because I think that is a that is a point that is really commonly missed in patients with ITP. So so let's let's make sure that we that we hammer that home clearly. I, I what I'm hearing you say is that there is no specific platelet count that is considered safe versus unsafe in someone with ITP. Is that how you would put it? Yep, you stated that right. I, I agree. Okay. Well, excellent. And that's, that's hugely important. So we're going to get a little bit more in, in, in a little while on some of the data, some of the data that you and your group have helped develop in terms of how patients with ITP are getting, actually getting transfused. But before we get there, I, I, there have been different 
opinions given about how platelets transfusions should be given in pla- patients with ITP when they are given. So could you talk a little bit about some of the options? In other words, some of the ways that platelets could be given or strategies that platelets could be given in a patient with ITP? Yeah, that's important. So before I give that answer about the range of modalities or by which we could actually transfuse a platelets, I want to say that the data, the level of evidence supporting any of these is is you know very little. Mm-hmm. We have either retrospective case studies or small case series or case reports largely that are showing what the effectiveness of platelets can be or not. There's no large studies. There are no um, randomized control data which have or studies that have evaluated the question. So our level of evidence when we talk about using platelets as a therapeutic option, as well as the grade of evidence, as I'd like to say, they are both low. Okay. So with that background, platelet transfusions, a life-threatening bleed in ITP can be given by themselves like solo. And that could be given as a, a single unit. It can be given as another modality where we give a bolus dosing followed by actually running a platelet drip where it's just transfusing slowly after giving a bolus dose. The other contrast, some of the patients may actually require massive doses. So repeated doses one after another while we're trying to get the hemorrhage under control. Another choice is, which is proven to be more effective, and actually in 40% of the patients in a retrospective study found out that platelets when given in a combination with IVIG may have better response in improvement in the platelet count as well as resolution of bleeding and a more sustained response. So the combination of platelet transfusions, if needed, being given with IVIG is more common. I have also heard people talk about strategies that I'll be frank, I have I have had my doubts about in the past, such as constant platelet drips or giving gargantuan doses of platelets. Do you have any thoughts on either of those? So again, I think, Joe, as a treating hematologist, I would say that I have personally, I have transfused platelets in um, ITP patients and or being part of a care team. You know, you these are usually patients who are sick enough to be in, admitted in the intensive care unit. So it is very closely monitored, but there are rare cases in which we are not able to get hemorrhage under control, so repeated doses of platelet transfusions are needed. But again, these would stand out as you know isolated, you know case reports, and mm-hmm. would not be typically suggested as a standardized therapy. Eventually, we have to remember that even if being given in an emergency setting, there are potential adverse effects of a transfusion, and those have always to be taken into account. I think that is hugely important, and we we may circle back around to that because what I want to what I want to give you the chance to do after we talk about what you found you and your group found in your excellent paper on on this very topic. I want to circle around to something that you guys found in the paper in in regards to how we can help people that practice at maybe smaller hospitals where there isn't necessarily the level of of expertise as in some major hospitals. So we'll I'll, I'll put a pin in that and we'll come back to it. But <laughs> Ritika, let's let's go right now to to your paper because again i think this is it's it was just such an outstanding look uh at it, it put it this way i think it filled a spot in in the literature that we really didn't have before so i would love to just to just give the floor to you to to talk a little bit about how you how you guys came to wanting to do this paper and and just the the general aspects of of what you found sure so i actually circle back to another prior publication we had earlier in 2015 joe where we looked at platelet transfusion in some platelet consumptive disorders primarily the focus was ttp and hit so thrombosis thrombocytopenic purpura and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And we used ITP more as like a control disease where we were trying to see would there be any adverse effects. And once we started digging into the data, we realized that the number of cases in which in hospitalized patients, we found platelet transfusions as part of like an ad hoc analysis, it was surprising. And so we decided to look a little bit deeper into it and see what exactly is happening this at the our people following the guidelines and how often are platelets indeed being transfused in ITP patients. So for this, we used a nationally representative database called as National Inpatient Sample or NIS. It is the largest all-payer 
inpatient database in United States. It captures hospitalizations from over 1,100 hospitals across the country, and in, there are 47 of the 50 states are participating in, da- in this database. And there's data that is extracted at the time of hospital discharge. So it kind of gets a nice snapshot of the entire hospitalization and what were the main comorbidities, main events, and the main procedures that happened during the hospitalization. So we captured using, at the time of this publication, Uh, It was data including only the ICD-9 coding. So this is uh, prior to 2015 when we had switched to ICD-10 codes. And we identified patients who were primarily admitted with ITP as their primary admission diagnosis. So in a span of five years, from 2010 to 2018, we were able to identify about 78,000 admissions. So that takes about 15 to 16,000 admissions around the country for ITP. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. we started assessing what the platelet transfusion practices in these were. And what we found is that in patients who are admitted with ITP as a diagnosis, surprisingly, about 15% of the patients received a platelet transfusion. So that's about one in seven patients. So what we found is that about one in seven patients reported receiving a platelet transfusion. We could actually document how many of them, the number of transfusions, and in about 2% of the patients, platelets were received twice, and about 1% of these patients received platelet transfusions three times or more. And we further went on to see that at least based on the ICD-9 discharge coding were these patients documented to have a major bleeding, which we, for the purpose of this study, classified as intracranial hemorrhage, GI hemorrhage, or gastrointestinal hemorrhage, or genital urinary bleeding, and also included epistaxis. So we, what we found is that in one-fourth of the cases, so in about 25% of the subject, at least one bleeding episode was documented. Again, I have to highlight that this is based on the ICD-9 billing codes. Okay. And then secondly, we tried to see were these patients undergoing an invasive surgery, you know, and procedure which could have warranted, offered an explanation for why the plate transfusions were happening. So putting both these criteria together, we found that in two thirds of the subjects where a platelet transfusion was reported, which as I said, in majority cases, a single unit was documented. We thought we noticed that neither was a major bleeding episode documented, nor did we identify a major invasive surgical procedure, which was there. The, the, the one procedure that was documented in most of majority of the patients was actually splenectomy and the platelet patients getting splenectomy on the uh, the patients getting platelet transfusions on the day of the splenectomy. So uh, it was very revealing in the sense that we have the guidelines from, as I mentioned, American Society of Hematology, AABB has commented on it in their guidelines, as well as review of uh, data that they put together, as well as the International Working Group of Platelet of ITP. However, what was surprising is that First of all, the number of hospitalizations in which platelet transfusions were documented. Secondly, the fact that we did not identify major bleeding episodes or surgery in either of these patients. To the question that really came is that are platelet guidelines truly being followed? Hmm. So we dug a little bit more into the data to see are are there specific scenarios in which we're seeing more platelet transfusions? And so what we found is that the platelet transfusions in the absence of a documented major bleeding are happening more in smaller Uh, hospitals, you know, the non-teaching hospitals or the non-urban. So let's say the small hospitals or the rural hospitals. And that brought up the important question that are people actually following or treating a platelet count, you know, a a low platelet count and response to that, treating patients prophylactically or offering platelet transfusion is just simply treating a number rather than an actual indication for a life-threatening bleeding. So what you just said is what I wanted to make sure that we got to, because I think that a lot of the people that listen to this podcast aren't necessarily practicing in the biggest hospitals in the world. Let's just speak for just a second to those who are dealing with this scenario in a non-urban area 
area where a clinician is looking to treat a platelet count specifically, are there any tools that we can give? Are there any discussion points that we can give to those laboratory folks and those pathologists perhaps that are covering blood banks that aren't necessarily blood bank experts in those scenarios where your platelets are just being used up, the few that you have, by scenarios that appear to be someone treating an ITP number rather than bleeding? Yeah, Joe, that is a very important point you bring up. So I think first and foremost to remember is that, you know, while transfusions are critical life-saving therapies and there is an inherent risk with every transfusion, right? So mm-hmm. platelet transfusions have their own independent risk, risk of febrile reactions, allergic transfusion reactions, and then most importantly, as we know, bacterial sepsis risk with platelets. There's a very hard discussion about FDA guidance on how to deal with that, so much so that it remains a very important topic, which can be a major risk for fatal outcomes in transfusions. There's also risk for, because of the plasma-containing platelet products, risk for trolley transfusion-related acute lung injury, and then Besides that, any transfusion transmitted infection risk remains. So there is a theoretical risk for something which could be as common as a febrile reaction or an allergic transfusion reaction or something rare as a transmission of a transfusion transmitted infection. First and foremost, to remember that any blood product, any blood component when transfused comes with its inherent risks. There is importantly a very important cost factor to be taken into account. Platelets are amongst the most expensive blood components. So anytime we're an overuse from a patient-centric perspective, you know, could it actually do harm to the patient than help? And also how it truly affects the overall financial burden on the healthcare, that's something to be important to be taken care of. The second thing clinically I want to point out is that, again, no platelet count specifically is outlined as a threshold beyond which someone should be transfused platelets. In general, we say that about five to 10,000 K platelet counts, five to 10,000 platelet counts is required to maintain the baseline endothelial integrity and the risk of spontaneous hemorrhage at platelet counts less than 10,000 and especially so at less than 5,000, the risk of spontaneous hemorrhage does go precipitously high. Still, regarding that fact, there is not a single cutoff or threshold that has been outlined. Whether it's 30,000, 20,000, 10,000, there is no number at which it is said that let's go ahead and transfuse platelets to prevent bleeding. There is no outlined role or recommendation of platelet transfusions as a prophylactic measure in ITP patients. If, however, a patient does experience severe life-threatening bleeding, what the International Working Group and ASH guidelines recommend is that do not delay treatment. If that patient has a major bleeding, you can consider platelet transfusions knowing that, number one, they may not help at all, or if they do help, the effect may be short-lasting. So the thing to remember is that taking all of this into account, that you know, if you need to reach out uh, and get expert uh, input from a hematologist, do that. But there are times, you know, when you have to take spot-on decision that you may not have time to take, have time for a consultation or an input. Then, if the patient is bleeding do go ahead and consider transfusing platelets, but knowing that concurrent therapies, which would produce, like the other treatment modalities I outlined, which will produce a long-lasting or a sustained increase in platelet counts is very important. And also knowing that, you know, the transfused platelets, they may or may not help. So it's not a modality that we can, you know, rely on with assurance. If we do need to transfuse, do that, knowing that it may not work. That's excellent. I I love that. Thank you so much. And honestly, even though I prefaced that as saying, let's give some tools to those in smaller hospitals, I think you and I both know that sometimes things like this do happen in major hospitals. And, And while I think it's important to circle back to what you said, we don't have enormous amounts of randomized, wonderful data that we can point to, to show that the guidelines are based on huge studies and with wonderful outcomes, et cetera. But at the same time, there's just no signal to show that there is benefit for over-transfusing patients like this. Is that is that an accurate way to put it, Ruchika? I think you summarized it perfectly, Joe. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> 
So everyone, there is a, a whole lot more to that paper that the Rachika was just talking about. And, and again, you can find the link to that on the show page for this episode. It's a, a study from Transfusion published in 2019, and it's wonderful. So please, please, be, please be sure to check that out, as well as a summary that I will link to on, on MedPage today. So you guys did a great job on that, Rachika. I want to make sure that we that we spend a few minutes talking about how ITP fits in with the findings that you guys published in the other paper that you mentioned. And it published in blood in 2015, uh, platelet transfusions in platelet consumptive disorders are associated with arterial thrombosis and in-hospital mortality. That was a really big and important paper. And, and I want to make sure that you get the chance to talk a little bit about that. As I said, we're spending most of our time today on ITP, but let's talk about what we expect in terms of how platelets can potentially cause problems in addition to the other stuff that you mentioned, the, the transfusion-related acute lung injury, transfusion-associated circulatory overload, those complications. But there may be an inherent danger that you guys outlined in patients with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So again, I'm going to open the floor to you a little bit and, and just have you discuss what you guys found and what your general thoughts and concerns concerns were when you published that blood paper. Thank you, Joe, for bringing that point about. And I think while with ITP, we see one end of the spectrum where we know that platelets, you know, may or may not work. And besides the general side effects of any platelet transfusion, there's no disease specific pathophysiology by which platelets should harm. Hopefully, you know, they, they will help, but if they do not help, you know, that's fine. In contrast, we actually have some other, what I would call as platelet destructive disorders or platelet consumptive disorders, hallmark being TTP and HIT, where the actual institutional platelet transfusions also likewise happens in an emergency setting typically. But it's important to know that because of the underlying disease pathophysiology, the same platelet transfusion can have very contrasting effects. So this has been proposed. Again, there is biological plausibility for the concept that for TTP, there's risk for arterial thrombosis and which could be fatal thrombotic events, both venous and arterial. But the, when the autopsy analysis was done, the principal histological abnormality found in TTP was that the clot is a platelet microvascular thrombus. So it is platelet rich, it's one lumen factor rich, but it is fibrin poor. So it's showing that there's lack of involvement of the traditional clotting cascade and the platelets can have a direct role in making, uh, causing microvascular thrombosis. And in the other end, uh, we have on the similar spectrum, we have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where we can also have both venous and arterial thrombosis, but in HIT, the, we have these heparin-dependent you know, antiplatelet factor immune complexes that are formed, which can cause platelet activation and cause thrombocytopenia and raise a, a risk for thrombosis. So what we did is using the same database, the NIS or National Inpatient Sample, identified cases of TTP and HIT admitted in the, these are hospitalized patients. And we specifically looked at those patients who were transfused with platelets, were they associated with any adverse outcomes? And what this paper showed is that among the three disease entities, so for both TTP and HIT, where we do have a biological possibility and small case series supporting possibility of arterial thrombosis, we actually did find an increased association with arterial clots in patients who had platelet transfusions. And these this effect remained after adjusting for the potential confounders, and is also including adjusting for their severity of illness. For TTP, we also found an association with risk for acute myocardial infarction with platelet transfusions. And in contrast, for ITP, we did not find any increase in venous or arterial thrombosis. I have to point out an important limitation of the study that, you know, at the most, this is a statistical association, it is something that is not enough evidence to draw a temporality or actually propose causality. It is just something that is providing some more evidence using a large database 
to suggest that yes, for both TTP and HIT, the platelets could have an adverse effect thus causing arterial thrombosis and higher risk for mortality, while not so for ITP. But given the limitations that it is restricted to the coding being ICD-9 and ICD-10 coding and their inherent limitation, as well as lack of exact temporality association. So I think it's more a hypothesis generating concept, which if possible, should ideally be studied in a prospective study or ideally in a randomized control trial setting. It's very interesting to hear this simply because I, as you know, Rachika, I've been around for a long time and I've been teaching learners in pathology and other specialties about transfusion forever. And I looked back after I saw this paper, I looked back on materials that I used to discuss with pathology residents back in the 90s. And I said back then, not that I'm brilliant and trying to pat myself on the back, but I think that I said back then that transfusion in ITP, TTP and HIT was contraindicated and that that it, it probably wouldn't hurt anybody with ITP, but the possibility of hurting someone with TTP and HIT was there. So I think that the, the supposition, as you said, has been around for a while, but this is the, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first larger scale data that I'm aware of that at least, as you said, supports that, doesn't necessarily prove it, but at least supports that. So this is the first national study and the largest cohort we could put together, combining five years of analysis. So I don't want to say you're brilliant. <laughs> and <laughs> no, no, and no. of course, like all the teaching you've been bringing about, which I am one of the like the huge learners and huge fans who's benefited immensely. I think, you know, what you mentioned as a general maxim, you know, it definitely stays true that to avoid prophylactic platelet transfusions when we can in these entities, Mm -hmm. uh, unless life-threatening bleeding is present, then take it on a case-to-case basis. So we're just like, that could we be adding fuel to the fire, actually, that Mm -hmm. part being there. And so individualized decision, take, think and follow. We don't like go by like a general rule that it is highly individualized and close monitoring is needed. Well, I want to put you on the spot for just a second, Rachika, because, and this is not fair. I will freely admit that this is not a fair question, but I will tell you that I've seen this scenario in real life multiple times. And it's just this. It's the scenario where, where a patient presents, they're highly suspected to have TTP. As you, as you know, patients with TTP, clinicians and those who deal in, in therapeutic apheresis tend to have a low threshold for starting therapeutic plasma exchanges in those patients for obvious reasons. The potential bad outcomes are significant, but the patient has an extremely low platelet count, just say 5,000 or so. And mm-hmm. and the therapeutic apheresis team wants to put in a central line and the interventional radiologists don't seem too terribly happy about putting in a central line with a platelet count of 5,000. I've seen in many cases, blood bankers say, okay, fine, give some platelets so that you can put the line in. I've seen in other cases, blood bankers saying, absolutely no way, you shouldn't do that and and just do the just do the central line anyway. Like I said, it's not a fair question and I'm I'm not asking you to give specific advice mm-hmm. for everyone in the world, but I guess my question is how do you deal in general with that sort of a almost a no-win situation? Yeah, Joe, you are bringing up a very important point, a real life scenario, you know, which we end up dealing with? Absolutely. So how I say is individualized decision making, having a discussion with the clinician about the pros and cons, it's important. You know, at times, from a blood bank or a blood center perspective, we eventually have to trust the judgment of the clinic, the treating clinician. And once from our end, you know, we can't put a hard stop on this. How I always say is that my recommendation would be in this specific case, yes, I understand this is an unusual scenario to go with it, a very low platelet count and try to put in a central line or start an invasive procedure. There is risk for bleeding. So given, however, that the this potential adverse outcomes can be so critical and we don't want to do an intervention which is prophylactic, but the adverse effect can be so severe it can actually cause by itself cause mortality or a stroke or you know a thrombosis in the patient. What I typically say is that we have a bag ready to go and it's approved if needed. If the patient bleeds, we will transfuse and I would not, you know, hold it back. But it is this exceptional scenario is definitely worth approaching that could this patient safely have 
the line put in without bleeding. So usually that's how I go. And most of the time it's worked fine. And I can tell you that in majority of the cases, Joe, we end up not transfusing. And because it's like, you know, they are more reassured that yes, there is a product that's available as an emergent product if needed immediately. It's approved and ready to go. But a lot of times they just don't need it and the patient does well. Right. I'm glad we were able to talk about that, Rachika, and I didn't mean to surprise you with that, but that's a, that's an important, as you said, it's a real world thing. Questions like that and concerns like that happen all the time in hospitals all across the United States. So Rachika, as we close our time here together, I first, I just want to thank you because this has just been a, a wonderful overview of the challenges that come about with, especially with ITP, but as also, obviously we've talked about TTP and, and heparin induced thrombocytopenia a little bit as well. I wonder if as we close our time together, if you just kind of summarize what you feel like are the most important learning points that those who are listening to this podcast should take home with them. Sure. I'd like to state that ITP or immune thrombocytopenia can present with extremely low platelet counts. Do not follow a number in taking a decision for an intervention like a platelet transfusion. It is a therapeutic option that is available to us should the patient have a life-threatening bleeding or hemorrhage. Important to note that platelet transfusions may or may not work, so they may have shortened survival after transfusion. Institution of a concurrent alternative therapy while we are doing emergency platelet transfusions is important. There is more data supporting concurrent use of platelet transfusions with IVIG as bringing better increment in platelet counts and better resolution of bleeding. Secondly, also to remember that there are other causes of thrombocytopenia or other platelet consumptive or destructive disorders like TTP, or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where because of the underlying pathophysiological mechanism, platelet transfusions may not help, but may actually be associated with significant adverse outcomes like arterial thrombosis and higher risk of mortality. So to sum it all, to know that platelets remain an important therapeutic alternative in managing some of these patients, but the decision-making should be highly individualized. And if we do transfuse platelets, make sure to have a close monitoring for any adverse effects. That's a terrific summary. Rachika, that's awesome. And I am so deeply appreciative of you spending time with us today. Thank you so much for sharing your amazing expertise with our audience. Thank you so much, Joe. You know, it's like, this is absolutely a my pleasure, my honor. Thank you for inviting me. Um, happy to help in any capacity. And if there's any follow-up questions, I'll be happy to take that. Hey, everybody, it's Joe again. Just a couple of quick closing thoughts. Most importantly, don't forget to go to the show page for this episode. That's bbguy.org slash 092, where you can find those references to the papers that Dr. Goyle was talking about during this interview. It's really important. Uh, those are papers that you should have for your files because there's lots of really good information and really good data in there. I've mentioned this before, but if you have the opportunity, I would really so much appreciate it if you would go to Apple Podcasts and give this podcast a rating and subscribe. Again, this is not for my ego. In fact, some of the things that people have written on there are kind of anti-ego to tell you the truth, which is fine. I, I'm very excited to get people's feedback because I always want to do this better. Um, and in fact, if you if you write something there, you may find it being read on a future episode of Blood Bank Guy Essentials. At any rate, what it actually does is it allows more people to get exposed to and hear about the podcast. So I would really appreciate that if you could manage to do that. I, I do have a continuing education episode coming up and it should be out very soon. That will be episode 093 and it's going to be a discussion of the mighty test that we call the monocyte monolayer assay or the MMA. That's a really fun interview with Sandy Nance from the American Red Cross. I'm very excited for you to hear that. It is coming up soon, I promise. But until that time, my friends, I hope that you smile and have fun. Please tell the ones that you love how much you do. And above all, never, ever stop learning. Thanks so much for listening. I'll catch you next time on the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Mm-hmm.